The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verana Media Network. This is an opinion-based program. This is Al Verana 24. Tonight, the battle has begun for the nation's top job. Tonight, all 35 candidates are campaigning to garner your vote, hoping to seek your approval to sit at the top. Despite your vote being the ultimate decider, various organizations backed up by foreign interest groups sought to undermine the people's franchise by targeting a single candidate in the hopes of taking him out before he is presented to you. Is this the best way forward? In a country where the same groups are calling for a free and fair election and a leveled playing field where every candidate can present their case to the people, how ethical is it to continuously label disrespect and disregard a single candidate while publicly humiliating him? To discuss about our current elections free and fairness, tonight my exclusive guest is the former Chief Justice Sarah N. Silva, who was the 41st Chief Justice of Sri Lanka and a key contributor to several landmark court rulings in our Republic. Welcome to Monday. It's time to get real. A happy Monday to all. We are back after a week's break. I'm Mahish Johnny and thank you for joining me this evening. The point of discussion tonight is whether how much of a free and a fair election environment do we really have in this country. Let's discuss. Well, tonight my point of discussion in my opening statement comes from the failed debacle and an absolute mockery of the judicial process courtesy of a so-called professor Chandra Gupta Thainwara, and an individual named Gamini Vyangudam. Now, it's all bunkum and balderdash. We now know that these two individuals went to the appeals court and filed a writ petition against SLPP for a candidate former Defence Secretary Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa, citing that the process of how Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa got his dual citizenship was in fact fraudulent. Liberal media ran a mock with this story, creating the atmosphere where it was all done for Mr. Rajapaksa. They were really hoping as to that was the case. It was very clear that under the current political environment in the country, the liberal left-wing government knows that they got no chance in the upcoming presidential election. Even the LPD Pradesh Sabha uh, election result showed exactly that. So they got the power for the past five years and absolutely did nothing. Of course, we need to give credit where the credit is due. There were a few good things like the right for the Information Act and the formation of the commissions through the 19th Amendment. That came into play under this current government. Those were all good. But in terms of making the lives of the people of this country better, failed immensely. And this government knows very well that the people will respond to their failure at the next polls. So let's forget the past for a moment. We are now heading for a presidential election despite what the 19th Amendment has done and what most of the so-called educated left says. The president still holds a commanding power when governing this country. So in that sense, it is vital that the people of this country listen to all 35 candidates who's vying for this position and make a decision of their own as to who's the best for the job. Every individual has the right to present their case before the people and then go forth to the people and ask them to back them up. This is how we democratically elect our leaders. That's the right way to do it. Despite all these organizations who call for the very democratic right and right to selection, this court case against just one individual has tainted that free and fair process. These two individuals have in fact used the sanctity of our judiciary to gain some unfair justice in favor of the candidate they are supporting. They wanted to eliminate their opponent not in the fair way by beating him at the polls. No, they wanted to do it by just bringing up fake allegations in the courts and tainting his right to stand for a poll. So, who are they supporting? 
none other than Mr. Sajid Premadasa, the UNP candidate. The UNP claim that they stand for democracy, they stand for the rights of everyone, this, that, and uh, the bells and whistles of a democracy. And yet here we see the failure of their simple principle aimed at an opponent, which they know they cannot beat in policy and vision. Well, thanks to the appeals court for once and for all, and prevailing and safeguarding the rights of every individual by throwing away this case as hogwash. The petition filed in the Court of Appeal by civil society activists Gamini Vyangwada and Professor Chandragupta Tenwara, challenging SLPP presidential candidate Gotabe Rajapaksa's Sri Lankan citizenship, was taken up for consideration for the third consecutive day today. The petition was taken up by the three-member judge bench comprising of Appeals Court President Justice Yasantakoda Goda, as well as Justices Mahinda Samewardana and Arjuna Obe Sekara. Petitioners also sought an interim order suspending Rajapaksa's passport and national identity card pending the court's verdict. Appearing on behalf of the defendant, former Defence Secretary Gotabe Rajapaksa this morning, President's Counsel Ramesh De Silva argued that the signature placed on the dual citizenship certificate by former President Mahinda Rajapaksa in 2005 was legitimate and the petitioner's claims that it is invalid are untrue. After considering the facts presented by both parties, it was announced that the decision of the appeal court on issuing an interim order on the petition will be announced at 6 p.m. As the hours passed, however, as decided by the appeal court, an announcement was made that the Court of Appeal has unanimously decided to dismiss the petition file challenging the citizenship of former Defence Secretary Gotabe Rajapaksa without taking it up for consideration. In a historic verdict by the Court of Appeal, the uh, Court of Appeal unanimously decided the case filed by Mr. Vyangoda and Mr. Tenuvara has no merit and accordingly it was dismissed without even issuing notice. The basis on which the case had been filed was that when Mr. Mahinda Rajapaksa, the then president, had issued the dual citizen certificate to Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa, he did not have the power to do so because he was not the minister. But the argument which was put forward on behalf of Mr. Honorable Mahindra Rajapaksha and Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksha by the legal counsel was that precedent is the repository of the executive power until the cabinet decides or cabinet is appointed or the subjects are assigned to the cabinet minister. He is the one who has the power and accordingly he could have done this at that point in time and if it is the case you can't make somebody stateless by taking that citizenship away after 14 years the other important thing is at the beginning it seems to be that everybody was saying that gotabe rajapaksha will not be able to withdraw his american citizenship but now that it is evident that the american citizenship had been withdrawn and renounced and he is only a sri lankan citizen then for the from nowhere they brought this action on the basis that his Sri Lankan citizenship was not good. It is good that they brought, as a result of which we were able to iron out all the differences and show that he had in all times, according to law, a very valid Sri Lankan citizenship. to the program. Uh, tonight we are discussing about how free or fair this current election is going to be uh, when uh, people are just uh, creating an environment that seems to be not exactly fair for every person. Uh, joining me to discuss uh, further about this is the 41st Chief Justice of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, Chief Justice Sarath N. Silva. Uh, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for do, uh, joining me tonight. Well, uh, we're in the cusp of another election, and uh, the, it's a presidential election. Uh, elections are seen as where we go to the public to get their verdict. And uh, usually even in the, in the judicial system or even in the parliament, people's verdict is uh, considered to be the supreme. Uh, when the judici uh, judiciary cannot solve a problem, uh, they send it back to the people asking whether, sh what should we do? So, um, sir, if I just say something like this. Now, in this particular election, we seems to be seeing where every single candidate, there are 35 candidates who's vying for this, uh, 34 candidates are ganging up together against one candidate. Uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajpaksa seems to be everybody is bringing case after case, uh, using the judicial process, uh, in my personal opinion, in an unfair manner. 
uh, and trying to get rid of this person prior to even coming uh, and standing in front of the people and asking for their support. Is this a free and fair election? Very relevant question, uh, Mahesh. Uh, this kind of impression can be formed and is being formed. I think you are quite right in your conclusions. Uh, Mahesh, what has happened in this instance is uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa is new to politics. Mm. He has never been a politician. And uh, he is, a, shall we say, a newcomer to the field. So, naturally, there is, uh, he is out of the system. He comes from out of the system. And he is, I think, for the first time we had a person, apart from uh, Mr. Fonseca, who contested from the military, uh, who has come from outside the system uh, with a recognized chance of victory. Now, at the time Mr. Fonseca contested, uh, the chances of victory were considered fairly dim from the beginning. Uh, I was quite aware of that. Uh, Mr. Fonseca took a, a fair gamble and failed. Uh, so uh, this is the first time we have a person who is coming from outside the system, but who has been part of the administrative system of this country. So he has made a mark for himself. Unlike Mr. Fonseca, who has not made a mark in the administrative field, Mr. Gotabi Rajapaksa has made a mark in the defense as well as administrative field. So he is a potential threat. Now my thing is, when you have a threat, you gang up and fight. This is how you draw the inference. When you have a potential threat, there are, you gang up and fight. Now for instance, uh, the leader of the opposition, uh, who is, should be the candidate. Mm -hmm. In every sense, he should be the candidate. He has been the leader of the UMP from 1994. So he has been prime minister for so long. He has been leader of the opposition, most experienced politician in that sense. So he should be the candidate. But he has withdrawn because he knows that the opponent who is coming up is a formidable opponent. That is why he has withdrawn for no other reason. If he had an opportunity of winning, uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me. <laughs> if he had an opportunity of winning, he should have, he would have uh, thrown himself at that. Uh, so. That shows when there's a formidable candidate, uh, Mahesh, this kind of thing takes place. Uh, there is a ganging up of forces. Mm -hmm. There's a ganging up of forces against him. And uh, probably, unlike Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa and other veteran politicians, they feel that uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa would have given in. Would have. I think that's why the pressure was uh, intensely mounted against him, if you want my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Pressure was mounted intensely against him because they thought, or whoever was doing it thought, that if you apply sufficient pressure, he might break. Mm -hmm. So I think that must be the reason why this kind of pressure is, uh, is continued to be implied. Uh, but uh, there, there is this question now, if somebody is standing for an election, he should have the, uh, uh, the, the, the freedom and the fairness to go to the public, present his case, tell this is my vision to the country. Uh, instead of doing that, we see prior to prior to him going uh, in, in front of the people, legal arguments have been brought into cases uh, which actually stands no ground, um, saying that he's a dual citizenship or, 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 or the way he actually got the dual citizenship uh, uh, certificate, this and that. Uh, do you think, in, in your opinion, sir, that can, can anybody have a free and fair election when, when some person has been labelled, unfairly accused? I mean, the court case actually came out and said that there is no case here. And, and at a time like that, but his name is tarnished. Uh, people, you know, there have been slander against him saying this and that and all that. So how fair is this? Well, uh, Mahesh, uh, you have to, I'll have to take the clock back. Now, uh, if you take the 19th Amendment, I have the 19th Amendment with you, which was passed uh, by the Yahapalani. Now, Yahapalani is good governance. Uh, good governance is governance according to the rule of law, basically. Law as it stands. Yeah. Law as it stands. If you take the 19th Amendment, uh, there were significant amendments, but three amendments were shall I say, smuggled in. Mm -hmm. Smuggled in particularly to dis 
qualify certain persons. Person, now, persons. Persons. Now, one disqualification is what you referred to. Is this where there is a citizen of this country who is also a citizen of another country. Now, this concept of dual citizenship mice has to be properly un understood. Now, we have a citizenship law which was passed in 1948. Mm -hmm. Now, in that law, according to that law, if you are a Sri Lankan citizen, the citizenship by descent, uh, that is in Sinhala, it's parampara, by, mm -hmm. by virtue of your father being generations. Yeah. Generations. So, he's a, uh, if you are a citizen by descent and if you acquire citizenship of another country, you lose your citizenship of Sri Lanka. Now, that was the law as it stood at that time. In 1987, the then UNP government, Mr. Jaya Javadana's government, felt that this was causing people to go abroad, mm. establish themselves, and lose connection with their mother country without bringing back the money that they earn. So, in order to encourage people to go abroad, earn money, establish themselves, and bring back the money, they introduced an amendment. And the amendment was that where a person has lost citizenship in terms of that provision, a citizen by descent who has lost citizenship, can make an application to the Minister of Defence. And if the Minister of Defence is of the opinion that the granting of uh, citizenship, now he has lost his citizenship, to be enjoyed whilst enjoying the citizenship of another country as well. So that is how you get dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. The president or the defense minister can make by order if he is satisfied that this is beneficial to the country. Mind you, that's a qualification. If it's beneficial to the country, grant him the citizenship that he lost without interruption. So even if there's a period that, uh, that you are not a citizen, that is also covered. Now, this was done by the United National Party itself with this laudable motive in mind. And hundreds, probably thousands of our Sri Lankans brought back their money. They, now they, they have uh, mm -hmm. sufficient interest in this country. So that is for the well-being of the country. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt about it. And, uh, and that citizen was a fully-fledged citizen of Sri Lanka because he is citizen by descent. He, what he has acquired is citizenship by descent. So, main attribute of a citizen, uh, Mahesh, is that it's a franchise. Yes. You are, if you are a citizen of any country, main attribute is franchise. Right to vote. The other side of right to vote is right to contest an election. Now, the 19th Amendment brought about, they f found that the Rajapaksa brothers who were then in the field mm. were, dual, uh, were citizens of the United States of America. So, to strike out that they brought in this amendment that if you are a citizen of another country, then you can't, you have a right to vote, but you can't contest it. <laughs> so that, that was brought about by in the 19th Amendment. Now, uh, this is a very, very unfair amendment. I will tell you very frankly, this is a very unfair amendment because there are certain persons who have a right to vote but can't contest. They are judicial officers, public officers, police officers, army officers, and other people holding public office. That is, uh, that is understandable. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't be, I can't be chief justice at context. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 so, uh, now, when you study this amendment, you get the last disqualification is if you are a member of the police force. Mm -hmm. After that, they have added this thing, another disqualification, or if you are a citizen of another country. No, oh, totally illogical. It, is not, it can't stand reason there because others are all officials. Mm -hmm. Now here, now they brought about this uh, thing. Now that is basically unfair because when uh, citizenship was restored to them, it was not told that you are now only half citizen. You can vote but not contest. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you get that kind of concept anywhere in the world. <laughs> if, you, if, you have a, if you have a right exactly. to vote, you should be able to contest, even in a normal society. Now we say there are so many societies, mm -hmm. associations, uh, you name it, but it is, uh, in everything, if you are a member, even in a club, you can contest. So now they brought about this, aiming at one person. Basil Rajapaksa also. <laughs> <laughs> not two, not two, <laughs> two persons. Okay. So now that was smuggled in by the 19th Amendment, illogical. Now mind you, these are people who have been allowed this, uh, granted this citizenship, on the basis that the granting of that citizenship is beneficial to Sri Lanka. The law said that. Yes. Now a person who is granted citizenship on the basis that it is beneficial is now denied the right to contest. 
So, exactly. are for sure, right? Or on a parity of reasoning, those who are beneficial can't contest. <laughs> the, 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 exactly. the, those who are not beneficial only can contest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is as illogical as that. Then the other one is now we had a disqualification that uh, you can't be contest uh, if you have held office of president on prior, on prior two occasions. Now this is following the American example in America, uh, President Roosevelt. Uh, who won the war uh, contested he contested thrice uh, because he won the war the second world war uh, he got and th- third time uh, that is the third time fourth time was he contested there he was now on a wheelchair mm-hmm. nevertheless the americans were grateful and voted for him uh, he, he couldn't complete his term he died then they brought the amendment that uh, this two term limitation so uh, that, that was the logic of that, that you can't because of some yeah. person is considered a hero, he'll go on. So in Sri Lanka also we had that uh, amendment, 18th amendment removed that disqualification. They removed. And uh, the democratic right of any person to contest and the democratic right of uh, the people to elect the person, if so minded, was restored. That is, that is, that is very fine because then people exercise their democratic right and outvoted, outvoted. So there is no logic to bring it back again mm-hmm. because uh, pe- unlike the people of the United States of America, people of Sri Lanka uh, exercise their democratic choice. So they are not overawed by factors. So there is no logic or reason to bring this back. But they brought it back aiming at Mahindra Rajapaksa, the only man who was in the horizon. Then there was an age limitation that a person can't contest the presidency if he's uh, below the age of 30. Now, we have had no problem. <laughs> now, you get my, <laughs> my line of reasoning. Now, we have had no problem of young people. If you take this uh, list of 34, they are all, uh, shall I say, old people. Very uh, fairly senior citizens, yeah. all about that. There are several who are young. Huh? A couple of people are young in this list. This time uh, not many. Na- uh, one from, uh, I think, Nagamua. Uh, doing the Nagamua. Uh, yeah, must be very few. Very, very, few. very, very few. But it had not been in the past. Yeah, exactly. It had not been in the past. Uh, so uh, then, anyhow, can't be young. Can't, he must be over 35. Over 35. Over 35. So there so they was no, no reason to increase this some more because we, in the last elections, we have never had young people contesting and, uh, shall we say, uh, bringing about youthful uh, yeah. disturbance in the election process. But they increased that to 35. Mm-hmm. Quite illogically, without any reason, targeting Mr. Namal Raj So now you see the 19th Amendment where the Constitution is the supreme law of the land is used to disqualify. So this is a long-term plan. This is a long-term plan of the gentleman who or so-called gentlemen who pioneered the 19th Amendment, none other than the Honorable Prime Minister himself. Now we can directly point to him, why did you bring these amendments? <laughs> and I'm sure no one can answer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> directly point to the man and say, why do you bring? No one can answer. So, Gota Be Rajapaksa, targeting of Gota Be Rajapaksa started as far back as 2015. Uh, <laughs> so, it is not a, not a, a, a game that he knew. Yeah. He, he was targeted from 2015 beginning. Uh, the other question that I have is, uh, let's say uh, the office of president is a public office, just like uh, the office of the uh, defense secretary is a public administrative uh, office. So um, if the question rises of his dual citizenship uh, when he's contesting or when he's standing for the presidency, my question is, why didn't it uh, was a problem back then uh, when he was uh, a defense secretary? Uh, and why, was, why wasn't it brought up at that time and pointed saying why is there a dual citizen um, working as our defense secretary this 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 yeah. seems to be uh, once again like you said targeting one specific family yeah now uh, now in this and the other question uh, sir, b- before that can you bring laws targeting families uh, that is called in latin ad hominem legislation mm-hmm. that is you target people ad hominem hominem in Latin is yes. of humans. You can never have that kind of thing. You can never have, this is targeting people. There is no, that's why I said, no. yeah. law must be rational. Now there is no rationality. I just demonstrate to you, because these are people who are considered beneficial to the country. Mm. Yes. <laughs> there, there is no rationality. The other person now twice, 
he had been defeated on the third time. So there is no rationality. Thirty five, of course, there is absolutely no rationality <laughs> other than Naval. <laughs> so so uh, there is no rationality. So this is ad hominem legislation. We have had a basic uh, principle of law that we have followed. We have studied as as uh, as uh, students of law. Uh, Queen was a Lienage case that was uh, uh, decided by the Privy Council. At that time, there were appeals to the Privy Council in England. And they said they targeted a particular group of persons who had conspired to overthrow the government. They brought about separate law. Uh, Mrs. Bandar Nagas government, they brought about separate law. Convicted here, in the, in the Privy Council, they said you can't have ad hominem legislation because this is targeting. Now, these are people, mind you, convicted of having attempted to overthrow the government. The Privy Council said uh, the facts are all right, there is conviction, but you can't have law that is uh, unfair. Uh, targeting a particular. So that's a, we, uh, our, our basic uh, principles. Those have been, I don't know who drafted these things. I don't think they have got their basics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is one principle that we are taught. You can never have ad hominem legislation. This is particularly, now I have demonstrated to you. Exactly. Uh, this is targeting uh, a particular. Otherwise, you can't have three amendments like this. <laughs> you can have one. <laughs> you can have exactly. three. Now, about the other question that you raised, which is also very relevant. Now, when in 2005, Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa won as president, and at that time, uh, Mr. Gotabi Rajapaksa had returned from the mm. United States of America to help his brother. So, naturally, the war, was go uh, the, the war situation, uh, it, it was a very dangerous situation, uh, Mahesh, at that time, because uh, there was a CFA that had been brought in by uh, Mr. Ranjil Vikram Singh, uh, and the LTT was consolidating in a massive way. In a massive way, not a small way. I know I was chief justice. They were consolidating in a massive way. They were the earlier bunkers were being fitted with concrete. They had uh, radio, uh, the communication mm -hmm. transmission towers fitted. Uh, the they had air ev strips, strips, everything done. So it was a formidable task for Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa. So he naturally would have persuaded Gotabe to stick on mm -hmm. and work as a secretary of defence because he he was a man who had sufficient experience, lot of experience. He he left Sri Lanka after the Jaffna operations where he found uh, people were abandoned, army was abandoned. I think there was some kind of, uh, uh, he had a real moral defeat there. Although he kept up, he had a moral defeat there because when the government decided to withdraw from Jaffna, mm -hmm. I think there were issues of principle and he withdrew from the army and he went out because his life was in danger. But I think Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa persuaded. But then at that time, they, he realized that he is a dual citizen. Uh, he is only a citizen of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. He had not yet not made an application. This is how this case came up. Mm -hmm. he, he was yet not. So before being appointed as uh, Secretary Minister of Justice, uh, he made an application to the uh, Minister of Defense. Uh, my minister then, my president had all the ministries with him uh, under the uh, Constitution as mm -hmm. to restore his citizenship. And that was, the procedure was gone through. That's why the Attorney General came and said the grant of this dual citizenship was regular. The senior, the addition, deputy or addition Solicitor General, a uh, very responsible officer who worked under me also, said it is regular. Because they could have, uh, they could have brushed aside at that time. They could have done anything at that time. They could have fudged any record. They could have dated it back. They could have done anything. But uh, they went the through process the was followed. process was followed particular record was kept. And not only that, there were 21 others where Mrs. Chandika Kumatunga has not um, the completed papers. Mm -hmm. So they were also given to go to Abhiraja. Then after having become a citizen of Sri Lanka, only he assumed the office of Secretary of Defense. Mm -hmm. so, th so that was very, very regularly done. Very regularly done. But I think they had access to these files. That is the basis on which this case was filed on a very thin basis. On the basis that at the time, Mahindra Rajapaksa, having full executive powers under the, before the 19th Amendment, President. granted this, uh, that the cabinet had not been appointed. <laughs> now but they had the that. president has the powers. <laughs> the president had the powers. Yeah. But they said the cabinet should be appointed. So that was a senseless argument. Mm. The president had all the powers. And it was, uh, and, and the, not only Jyotabe, you can't say it was done ad hominem, <laughs> to use my same phrase. Mm -hmm. There are 21 others. I think Mr. Ramesh Chilla, very, very uh, completely, uh, all the people who were, whose applications were there were allowed at that time. 
and uh, and that was regularly done. So these uh, whoever who did this case had hunted up all these things. Now I know this is 2019. They have hunted up the files in uh, which were available in the Ministry of Defence, and you know who the Minister of Defence is. No? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they hunted up and found this. Shall we say? Um, uh, a point which is not worthy of any consideration whatever mm-hmm. to say that well the ministers are not a point he had the power he was anyhow the minister of defense because there's a judgment that uh, was given at, at the time i was chief justice that the president immediately becomes a minister of defense uh chandika kumar tunga saw an opinion we said under the prior to the 19th amendment that the president immediately becomes a minister of defense mm-hmm. So he had the full power, it was granted. Then as you correctly pointed out, uh, Maish, he continued to function. The full period, he went through the war. He must have signed thousands of detention orders. Exactly. <laughs> now none of those people did, were uh, challenged. Thousands of detention orders were filed. So of all the detentions would be illegal otherwise. Exactly. Yeah. Then, yeah. Sorry. So, no, I mean, uh, just uh, before we go in uh, for a commercial break, just quickly explain to us, the court threw this case out. W- what does that mean? I-, I mean, for a layman to understand, does that mean that the court did not take any consideration of what the, 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 uh, the a- accused party was saying? Or, or what, what was the legal uh, Now, process? the case went on for three days. That's exactly. the problem. And the court threw it out, uh, I think the president of the court of appeal said, in limine. That means, in Dimine means, he, they appeal the preliminary objections itself. Mm-hmm. That the preliminary objection that are raised was, this is far, far belated. It's a writ application. A writ application is an application that is granted, it's an extraordinary remedy. Mm-hmm. We say it's an equitable remedy. And it has to be brought promptly. So we have judgments which say that delay of six months, you must dismiss a writ application. This 14 years. So that is straight away done. Then AG says it is regularly performed. So there is nothing to proceed in that. Mm-hmm. So all these factors got together, the, the court, and that it has not been challenged. There are so many acts have done. There are 21 others mm-hmm. who have not been made parties who are going to be seriously affected. Yeah. So many, many facts were there. So the court said, since there was uncertainty, nominations are coming, I think the court quite rightly said, in Dimine, uh, we dismiss this application after a full hearing. Yes. After full Please. hearing. I think the case could have been thrown out in 15 minutes, if you want my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the Chief Justice, <coughs> one more thing. Um, the the a- accused uh, party, uh, the persons who brought this case, said that apparently they will go to the Supreme Court. Will they stand a chance there? Uh, not at all. Not at all. There is this party who uh, accuses the people who file this petition. They are uh, the same gentleman has filed a case against me also for contempt of court. He is a routine litigant. <laughs> he's, he's a routine litigant, a professor, a routine litigant. He filed a case when, when he addressed a meeting and asked for election. He said, there's contempt of court. And on five days, I had to go to court. Uh, the, the petition... Uh, has first seven pages is a tirade against me. Nothing about the statement. Five days I went to court and uh, the same counsel, Mr. Ramesh Silva, took many objections saying that uh, this is this is mala five days. Same grounds. <laughs> that it just maligned the person and the court took up that as a preliminary objection and reserved the order. So they will deliver the order in due place. But it's the same person. <laughs> now that case was coming up in the Supreme Court on that day where he has filed another case in the in the court of appeal so this man is a busybody <laughs> <laughs> indeed well uh, that is uh, a good point to take a short commercial break uh, this is get real and we are in conversation with former chief justice of sri lanka uh, saratan silva we'll be right back after a short commercial break stay with us Sri Lanka, Sarath and Silva. Um, so, if you move on to the next portion of our discussion uh, with regard to the executive presidency, one thing that most uh, opposing parties uh, are saying is the fact that um, 
the next president is going to be a u- useless president in, in terms, if I, if I may use that term, because apparently they say the power has been curtailed by the 19th Amendment. Is that the case? Uh, I beg your pardon, Mahesh, when you say next president is use, useless. <laughs> I think it is more appropriate to the incumbent president. <laughs> <laughs> so, uselessness is to be judged from what is now. Uh, no, that's a, that's a, once again, I must tell you, it's a very, very, uh, that's a current thing. The impression is created, next president is, to use your words, uh, will be of no use. Mm-hmm. He will be just a figurehead. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, uh, Mahesh, that's not uh, quite the right uh, uh, situation. Because this executive, what we call as the executive presidency is under the British system, if you, if you contrast the two, under the British parliamentary system, the executive forms part of the parliament itself. That is, uh, the prime minister and the cabinet of ministers are also members of parliament. And they have total executive power as well. In England, that is the case. In India, that is the case and so on. Uh, executive presidency means you draw out the executive from parliament and have a directly elected executive who is a head of state. So he is not a nominal head of state, he is a, he's a, a head of state with power. Uh, now in England the head of state is the queen who is nominal. So that is a difference. But in Sri Lanka we have got a slightly hybrid system. In the US and France, the ministers are not drawn from parliament. In Sri Lanka, somehow Jaya Jayadana thought it fit to draw the ministers also from parliament. Mm. So we have a mixed system where the uh, ministers yeah. are drawn from parliament. Now in the United States of America, uh, the secretaries, as they yeah. call it, they are not drawn from, yeah, uh, from, from Congress. Uh, they, they, yeah. are, they are total appointees. Probably their nominations are approved by the Senate. Uh, but uh, they are totally uh, different people. So, if he have a somewhat of a hybrid system and uh, the executive power, plenary executive power is in the president. That is there in Article 4, the basic article of the Constitution, which says the executive power of the people, including the defense of Sri Lanka, shall be exercised by a president elected by the people. Now, that article can't be touched other than with a referendum. So, so far that article remains. So, it is executive power of the people shall be exercised by a president elected by the people. So, that is the executive power is in the people. It is reposed to now the president. Who is responsible to the people? No one else. Mm-hmm. So, that remains. Now, what has been done uh, from the, about the 17th Amendment onwards is to trim this power. Now, 17th Amendment brought about uh, Mrs. Kumar Tunga's time, Chandika Kumar Tunga's time. She lost the majority in parliament and she had to came into certain amendments. One was this power of, power of appointments with regard to the judiciary and the public, higher public service. Now, those uh, appointments had to be done on the recommendation of the Constitutional Council. Yes. So, that, that, that was a, a balancing. It is a trimming of power. So, that continued, even on the 18th Amendment, that was there. Instead of the Constitutional Council, it was called Parliamentary Council. Now, 19th Amendment made it Constitutional Council again. So, 19th Amendment, uh, so that is, that is already trimmed with regard to appointments. So, there is a balance there. There is a balance. It's a sharing of that responsibility. Some appointments are done on the basis of recommendation of the President, uh, approved by the Constitutional Council, some on the basis of recommendation made to the President. So there is a balancing of that. Then the 19th Amendment brought to significant. There was a there were provisions in the previous uh, the uh, constitution prior to the amendment that the president can retain any minister to himself, and any subject unallotted or unassigned shall be exercised by the president. Mm-hmm. Those two provisions were there. I think those are very vital posi- uh, provisions uh, that were necessary. Otherwise, there can be a breakdown of government. Now, mm-hmm. which happened? Which Indeed. happened in the last... Yes. Uh, 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 with when the president is from one side and the government goes on the other side. And uh, we have had chaos. In the last four years, my answer, if somebody were to just ask a frank question, has government functioned? Answer is, a capital N, capital O, no. <laughs> government has not functioned. That is because this kind of uh, mismatch uh, has created uh, chaos. The president has sufficient power to cause chaos. 
Mm-hmm. But the president is, doesn't have the full power to control the affairs. So that, that's the problem. So he has, uh, Mr. Maitipal, the citizen, the president, has used that power. He has uh, dissolved parliament. Then again, it goes back. Then he sacks the prime minister. Then he does this. Uh, so yeah, then he mixes up functions. Because under the present uh, system, the president is solely responsible for deciding on the number of ministries. Mm-hmm. That's a vital power. Indeed. Indeed. So, so now it's a list. There's a limit on 30. There's a limit. And uh, he decides on the uh, subjects and functions. So that's a, that's a vital thing. Only thing is he, he can make appointments only on the advice of the prime minister. And he can't remove them. Now those limitations are there. So what uh, the incumbent president does is he changes subjects and functions. So that's why no minister. Now today, if you want to know, no one knows who the minister of which subject is. That's that's very sad because he can mix up. Mm. He, he can he can mix up like uh, mm. the state Rupuani corporation was put <laughs> back into the defense. <laughs> so, 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 something like that. He can he can mix up. So that kind of uh, so that is not really uh, trimming of executive power. That is, in my view, if, uh, from a perspective of law, it is confusion of executive power. What the 19th Amendment did brought about confusion Indeed. in the area of executive power. Uh, sir, if, if, I mean, we see from time, from the 17th Amendment onwards, whatever the amendments that keeps coming into this constitution is uh, literally contaminating the process of, of governance. Uh, we, we, we trim this and it, it creates another set of issues. We trim that, then there is another set of issues. We saw that uh, with examples in the uh, after the 19th Amendment uh, in, in the past two years. And with the new president coming in uh, on, on the 17th of November, seems like this question and these problems are going to continue in a much more bigger uh, version as we go on because every day there will be an argument saying, no, this is not the way it should be interpreted. It should be done this way. So it's, it's, it's literally creating an unstable governing system. You're quite right, uh, Mike. It's quite right. These things have been done without vision. When you do an amendment to a constitution, it has to be done with great vision because it's a supreme law of the land. These things have been done for ad hoc purposes. Now, uh, I'm very sad to talk about Mr. Anil Vikram Singh. He, as Prime Minister, wants to trim <coughs> Mr. Sir, uh, Maitapala Sirisen as much as possible mm-hmm. and bring him down. Now, that is well and good. If this thing is a uh, match between the two of them, we mm-hmm. have no problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> they can hammer each other as much. But here, it's a country. You are playing a match with the playing ground is a country. <laughs> so you are yeah. trampling the people, people's rights, people's institutions, uh, government itself is being brought into this kind of situation. So uh, this is a time. Now we can't. We have no way of now drawing the line back. Exactly. We have no way of drawing the line back and say we have now first. Now this government made a big mistake of saying we established a constituent assembly, we are going to change the constitution, we went around the country, spent millions yes. of rupees, our experts travel around the world, <laughs> saw, the, saw the world, and produced nothing. If I can use an expression which you know very well, the mountain has labored and brought forth a mouse, not even a mouse now. Exactly. <laughs> not, not even. <laughs> we see only the tail of the mouse yeah. now. <laughs> so, 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 so my, what has happened is, 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 is sad. It's tragic. The people, uh, the country is suffering as a result of this. So this is a time where we must have a working arrangement. Now, until we, um, from my point of view, this can be worked. Mm-hmm. This can be worked if there is a understanding between the president and, and the, the party that wins uh, the election. Uh, that means that will be the prime minister, president, and the prime minister. There has to be not an understanding, a perfect understanding. Then only we can get this ship uh, back to stability. It's it's even vital for the people to understand when they go to the polling booth um, to create uh, towards a stable government rather than actually looking at, you know, I don't like this person, I don't like that person, all this and that and all these agendas of we don't want the 225, this and that. But what they really need to be thinking about is the fact that how are we going to make, stabilize our government? The executive has to also come from the same party and it should, uh, the, even the government should come from the same party. If not, we will have complete chaos once again. 
Uh, you are quite very right in that. People have to be mindful of the broad picture. Now it is not only electing a, a president. Yeah. People have to be mindful of the broad picture. About the general election as general well. General election. Now they were, they were quite mindful. Now, uh, shall we say, uh, Chandika Kumar Tunga, Mrs. Chandika Kumar Tunga was first became prime minister. Yes. Uh, and, and then people saw the broad picture and they gave her overwhelming major, uh, mandate as the president. Now she scraped through the parliament election, but in the in the presidential election, her her margin was 63 percent or 62 percent, highest, highest, highest ever. So people know how to look at the broad picture. At that time, they were not swayed. Mr. Gandhi Sanayak was uh, assassinated mm. on the eve of the election, but still the widow couldn't evoke mm. sympathy. Couldn't, couldn't evoke sympathy. So people have to make a democratic choice on the basis of the broad picture. We have to be mindful, soon after this presidential election, there will have to be a parliament election. Absolute waste of resources, uh, Mahesh, if you ask Indeed, me. This, this, this election is five, going... Five, five billion rupees. Yes. Another five billion or more. And that is also uh, because of the fact that we have 35 candidates and out of that 35, uh, I mean, being honest, uh, there are only four or five viable candidates who actually can garner at least a commanding majority of, 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 of the people's votes. And the remaining people are just there for nothing and and they're literally wasting the state's resources and money no quite right now we have we have surplus of elections in this country exactly. there's, there's no doubt about it uh, we have a surplus of elections in fact we brought about we drafted an amendment uh, way back in 2014 uh, to have this presidential election and parliament election together so there will be one the wave will be in one direction that is necessary now it is going to happen almost like that I think soon after this presidential election, uh, there had to be a parliament election. There has to be a gap of about two months. months. I don't think we need to have even that gap, but there has to be a parliament election. And people have to, when they are voting in a, a president, be mindful that his party should be the party that should be able to command the majority in parliament as well. That means if when they are uh, actually looking at uh, who, who the candidate is, not just look at the candidate, but look at the party uh, ahead to, to uh, 2020 general election and see exactly how they can give this particular president, whoever it may be, whether it's from the United National Party or the SLPP or whatever, uh, whether they can give that particular person the power in the parliament uh, so that that particular vision can be uh, that, executed. So they, they have to take the broader picture. They have to take the broader picture. Is this party, does this party have a suitable person to be a prime minister? Indeed. So this is not only a presidential election. Yeah. This is an election where the people have to be mindful of this, is this, can this party produce a prime minister who can work with this president. Indeed. <laughs> that, that, uh, that amount of uh, vision and wisdom our voters have to be invested with. I think that is very important that that public opinion is created. Can his party produce a suitable Prime Minister, who can work in cooperation with this president whom they are going to vote. If you bring about a disjunction, disjunction at this stage, then there's going to be the chaos that we have been going through for the, the last five years. Indeed. Four years. Um, let's take a short commercial break. Uh, we are in discussion with uh, Chief, uh, former Chief Justice Arthur Silva uh, right here on Get Real. We will be right back. Get real. I'm in conversation with uh, the 41st Chief Justice of this country, uh, Sarath and Silva. Um, sir, uh, in our last session, I want to uh, get your attention to one of the promises that might come up in the UNP candidates' uh, manifesto is getting rid of the executive presidency. Now, if they are going to get rid of the executive presidency within six months, it seems that this entire exercise is a redundant one. We could have uh, gone to a referendum, have have uh, have that whole process, and just get rid of this this thing, and not spend millions and billions of uh, public money uh, in order to hold elections, and then to get rid of that office. 
is it a doable exercise? Because we've been hearing about getting rid of the executive presidency since 1994, President Kumarathunga's time. It, it, it has been constantly peaking up uh, during elections, and then when they get the power, nobody wants to talk about it. And it seems like, for me, uh, as a journalist, um, uh, that this is some kind of uh, a gesture done towards the minority parties in order to garner their support. Uh, to just to say, hey, we're going to get rid of this, support us, but then as soon as they get the power, everybody forgets it. Do you think it's a doable process? And what, what exactly? Can, can a president get rid of the presidency, uh, the uh, executive presidency within his term, five years? No, no, uh, Mahesh, this has to be looked at realistic. Your program is get real. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be quite realistic about this. It is uh, Mrs. Chandrika Kumatunga who called the Bahubhuta constitution. She made that a political platform. Maybe she was sincere to begin with. Maybe she was sincere to begin with. But uh, I personally know she was not sincere towards the end. <laughs> 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 because uh, if uh, she was sincere, she, that would have been the first amendment she could have brought when she was prime minister. Indeed. <laughs> if she was sincere. Uh, she became prime minister first. And uh, she could have easily got the support of Mr. Gami Sanayaka, who was uh, in the UNP. Mm -hmm. And they could have easily had a referendum instead of the presidential election. Yes. So she was not sincere in that. Uh, she made this a campaign platform. Maybe at that time she was enamored with this concept of changing. Because there was absolute hatred towards mm -hmm. Mr. Jayajayavadana and what he represented then the United National Party. The United National Party had been in power for 17 years. At that time. So there was uh, sufficient anger, animosity. Mrs. Bandarnak had been stripped of her civic rights. So I think it was a way of giving vent to, vent to this animosity and mm -hmm. anger uh, that uh, she said this. But if she was sincere, first thing she would have done as Prime Minister was to present this yeah. amendment and uh, gone for a okay. referendum uh, on this issue. On this issue, so uh, Gami Sanak and Ranil Vikram Singh were in the opposition. They should have, should have thrown the gauntlet at them. Now, take it up. Mm -hmm. Are you prepared to do away with this? She didn't do that. She nicely got herself elected as a president using this once again as a lever. And then, when it came to the crunch, she said, executive presidency will cease only at the end of my term. Mm -hmm. So this is where it crashed altogether. So thereafter, Mr. Mahindraja Paksa, although she, he said that, he had to face a war. He Indeed. knew powers of executive presidency are essential. Uh, so I don't think he meant it. I, I don't think he said this. He said it also. Mm -hmm. uh, he said this. But that was, that was just kept as a campaign slogan. So still it is a campaign slogan. Uh, the, the, you, you, you create a monster of a presidency mm -hmm. and say that I am going to get rid of it. <laughs> and you become the monster. <laughs> so so, so that, 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 is, that, that is senseless. That is quite senseless. And I am sure Mr. Gotabi Rajapaksa is not um, talking. Not, not no, running not, on that campaign. Not, not yeah. running on that campaign at all. Uh, and the thing is, uh, we have to bring about a workable relationship between the president. Then, of course, it may be useful. Some kinds of checks and balances are very useful in, in a democratic system. But somebody must have the last say. Indeed. Somebody must have the last say. Now, in, in Britain, now this is what happened. I'm sure you, are, yes. you, know, you know about foreign affairs. You know more about foreign affairs than me. Uh, now, if you see the Boris John, John, Johnson on the Brexit, he doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> if you see a confused man, that, that is the Prime Minister of England. <laughs> so, he is, uh, and one of the ministers said, we'll have to caution him if he's doing something really suicidal. I think this Patel. Uh, uh, Indeed. <laughs> she, she said that if she's doing something suicidal, we'll have to warn him. So, uh, somebody has to decide on things. Somebody has to decide. The final say must be in the hands of some person who will also who will also be responsible to the others, responsible to the country, that and make a responsible choice. So we have to bring about a working relationship. I think the next this this juncture is a vital juncture. We don't have to talk about abolition of this amendment to the constitution. All these things we can just forget about for the moment. See if there is a constitution, try to work it. That is my, now United States of America had the first written constitution. Mm -hmm. Still the original draft 
is there hand written in yes. washington i'm yes. sure you see you get that marble dome mm-hmm. uh, it's there so they are very proud of it so they have done so many amendments there are so many adjustments and so on but you have to work with this so they have made a, now they are working with that they are keeping president donald trump mm-hmm. uh, in yes. in in rains you know, some uh, some impeachment motion something otherwise he'll run right yes <laughs> so so he is he is kept in in rains so that kind of arrangement we must have if you take a look at the us uh presidential system uh their checks and balances with the senate the congress uh, the president and the judiciary um what can we learn what what, what can we d- d- derive from that system um and bring into our system because apparently what what ha- what seems to have happened to us is we have tried to put two separate systems together and then made a real mess out of it yeah. um so if that is the case um what can we learn right now from them and actually uh f- into the future what what are the changes we can make well the american president is the most powerful person in the in the world there's no no gain saying he his word counts so that is because the constitution gives him that that uh, multitude of power mm-hmm. that amplitude of should be amplitude of power he is given in the constitution that he can make pronouncements and make them be heard mm-hmm. that that is very important thing we have to learn that uh whatever mr donald trump says he's heard and uh, the people listen to him mm-hmm. uh, so america has one voice maybe rational at times maybe contradictory at times but america has strengthened all said and done the america has the america has grown in strength mm-hmm. he is withdrawing troops there is some kind of i of course see some kind of pattern in this whole thing mm-hmm. it is not all that at the same time there is a check by con- by congress yeah. the two houses yeah. there there is a check at the same time the check may be too much in the united states now that is something that we have to say the check may be a little too much uh, where the financial control uh, sometimes the presidents uh, sometimes the check is used to sometimes the check may be a little too much mm-hmm. but the judicial check has been there fairly firm mm-hmm. fairly firm so this checks and balances have worked in the united states of america to a great extent and i think we have to learn from that i think our judiciary also now the last judgment shows that they, they can make a quick mm. decision otherwise there would have been utter confusion yes. in, the, in the respect of, so they have made a quick decision i think judges should be commended for doing that in the, in a in a acceptable way in a very acceptable way they heard everybody for days they heard and found nothing no merit we we throw it out so there is a check there there there, there is a balance that, that is coming in parliament must be more more active our problem here is the parliament is mostly inactive mm. if you go to the house of parliament i don't think there is anybody who is really doing anything there <laughs> worthwhile <laughs> sad to say <laughs> very often there are only few members that is because they have no role that is that is because they have no role in this. Uh, they have no role in this serve now there are oversight committees this mm-hmm. committee cop committee that committee the problem is is that all those committees are sitting in parliament and they are trying to control an administration which is outside a mm-hmm. uh, secretary or somebody finds it so difficult to go to parliament to those committees where they, he has to clear so many security obstacles by the time he goes there the the, the executive the, the the role of parliament must get more involved in the running of government i think this oversight committees and things with all due respect once again to mr anil vikram singh should not be in parliament because he likes to have everything in parliament he is the lord of parliament <laughs> you have been there for over 40 years you have can be lord <laughs> you there you have quite prestige rights <laughs> so when you are lord of parliament you try to keep everything under that roof uh everything under that roof the agriculture ministry was uh, now they we have spent millions because they they wanted that for oversight committee so oversight committee said no these committees must move to ministries and i think that's the way we have to get it uh, functional the us committees work very very efficiently Indeed. very very efficiently they keep a check on these things the advantage in us is that everything is in washington and washington is the seat of government and is that who goes Indeed. to washington no that it's the government there it has no commerce mm. the commerce is yes, all in new york, new york and, york, yeah. new york and other 
places like that. So we have to move these uh, MPs, make them work more. I think there are very capable members yes. of parliament. Uh, uh, you have to make them without just slanging each other. They can do that once in a way. Uh, just, uh, that's, that's something that we, I mean, we do see them um, debating uh, in the house. Uh, screaming at each other, you know, talking sometimes in filth and all <laughs> that, that, but actually we do not see them literally doing the work for the people. Um, and the next time you see them is either in an election stage or a platform, again, talking some, some, something useless most of the time. Uh, so it's indeed uh, a good thing that I mean, if we can get them actually to do something and, and try to be more, more uh, participatory in the governing process. Yeah, my, my view is that we had a very successful system uh, in the state council, Dhanamo constitution, executive committees. Mm -hmm. Now all members of the state council are members of executive committees. Mm -hmm. Like that, you get mem members of parliament as executive committees in each of these ministries who will go to the ministry. Mm -hmm. You can't get them to come to yeah. the parliament. This is the mistake that Mr. Anil Vikram Singh is. You can't, they can't bring. Ministries are full of files. Yeah. This is still, uh, we, we are yeah, not exactly. in the uh, electronic digital, digital system. Yeah. We still have files. <laughs> so you have to get them in. Uh, I think we have to work out a system, some practical system where we get them also involved, the opposition, provincial council members involved in running of ministries. That is where government matters. I think that is an arrangement that should be the new president should work on. And he can do that only if the parliament is also like-minded. <laughs> so we must have not only vote for a president, but also vote for a uh, prime minister in the future. Indeed, um, Chief Justice Saratin Silva, that is a very good uh, place to end our conversation for today. I want to thank you especially uh, for taking the time and joining me on this discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll be right back on the other side uh, with uh, my closing arguments. Stay with us. Before we end tonight's program, I want to once again bring to your attention the importance of thinking beyond the 2019 presidential election. As Chief Justice Arathan Silva says, we need to be prudent when selecting the candidate for presidency. Yes, there are certain powers that has been curtailed from the 19th Amendment uh, from the president, but still, we are going to have an executive president who now needs the support of the parliament and the prime minister more importantly. He need to do that in order to carry this state forward. So when you are deciding on as to who to vote, you really need to think beyond 2019 and to the 2020 general election. More so, what kind of a government can take power and support the new president and his vision? Take some time to study the parties that are at hand. The front runner, the SLPP, and we now know that the Prime Minister of a possible SLPP government is going to be current opposition leader Mahindra Rajpaksa. And then the current government, the UNP, its possible future government will be led by incumbent Prime Minister Ronnie Wickram Singh himself. I'm not going to talk about any other party or any other candidate because let's be realistic, none of them will be able to form a government. So both these leaders have been in power from time to time. You have the ability to see who did what and was that the best for this country. Check their past actions and then select the party and their candidate for president. Because we really need a stable government and a stable presidency to move forward. The so-called January 8th revolution was an utter failure and was a step back towards disaster. That is very clear now. So before you cast your vote, think. Will the duo Gotabe and Mahindra Rajpaksa or will the duo Sajid Premadasa and Rani Vikramasinghe be a better combination to work together in order to move this country forward? Now before we end, I want to leave you with this quote from Bernie Sanders, a two-time presidential hopeful in the United States who said, Election days come and go, but the struggle of the people to create a government which represents all of us and not just the 1%, a government based on the principles of economic, social, racial, and environmental justice. That struggle continues. Uh, Mahesh Johnny from all of us here at Other Than 24 and the Get Real Team. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next week. Good night.